Contained within the pages of these notes is a humorous story to begin with. And I'm, I know that you're anxious. So I found a story about a man that went into a job interview and he's sitting there with the boss and the boss declares to him, I want you to know that we have two rules about our company that are very important to us. These are like the values of our company. And the, the second rule is this, that uh, we, we hold to a high standard of cleanliness. So I want to ask you, did you wipe your feet when you came, uh, did you wipe your feet on the doormat when you came into the office this morning? And the man, you know, he's nervous and wants a job. He says, yes, sir, I did. And the boss uh, says, okay. And then our first rule and our main rule is honesty. We have no doormat. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> I want to let that set us up for this morning. How we live matters. Well, that's a humorous story, but how we live matters. And in particular this morning, what, we wanted, what we're going to talk about, um, a theme that comes up often, actually, I think, as we go through the text of Scripture, that how we live our lives matters, and it represents who we are. It shows the rest of the world that we're followers of Jesus Christ when we live with things like honesty, integrity, uh, humility, and, and so forth. We're going to talk about that this, this morning as we get into Romans chapter 13. If you want to start looking it up, we'll go into it pretty much right away. I just want to take a moment and, and, uh, and thank Grayson for teaching last week. He taught through Romans chapter 12. And uh, I just want to affirm something that I thought was fantastic that he said, that I gave him a real gift in letting him teach 12, and I took 11, 10, and 9. <laughs> uh, uh, those, those were all setting up into 12. and tw 12, uh, I think he used the word, it's just a little easier to digest. Um, it's, a, it's maybe a little clearer and, and has a good layout to get through it and so forth. He did a great job. I appreciate that. And I just wanted to um, just kind of uh, recap briefly, uh, as he talked about from Romans chapter 12, uh, that uh, we need to, we want to want to look at the opening verse of that again that he m kind of focused on last week, because chapter twelve is really just an extension of the chapters before it. Um, as Paul had been teaching all this other stuff, then he gets into twelve and and says, now because of all that I said, this then is how you should live. That's kind of the idea or the outline, if you will. And chapter 13 then is a continuation of 12. So it's really just, he gives us some stuff in 12 and says, this is how you should live. And then 13 is just a continuation of that thought. And in particular, Grayson read from chapter uh, 12, verse 1, it just says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercies, and then it goes on to say, become a living sacrifice. So we should consider then, what does he mean by in view of God's mercies? What are God's mercies? Well, it's everything that Paul had been talking about leading up to this point. Um, as, uh, uh, as well as so much of the rest of the scriptures talk about the mercies of God. And because of God's mercies to us in our thanksgiving, uh, in, in, in the new life that he's given to us, then we, should, then we should live our lives well before the Lord. In view of his mercies, we give our life, we sacrifice our lives to him. The psalmist Davis, David pondered this question in Psalm 8 when he considered the heavens and the moon and the stars and, all the, and he's amazed by all that God had created and that he is the God who not only created all the universe but also now governs all the universe. And as he pondered the, the creativity and the immensity and the wonder and the glory of God, the psalmist asked this question. So what is man? Who am I? When we think of all that God is and all that God can do and all that God has, has done, and he says, so what is man that you should be mindful of him? Why should we matter? Why should our insignificant lives matter to the God who has created all things? But God, we do matter. God does care. God does love us. God does look at our way. God is keenly aware of every detail of our lives and he knows everything about us and he is intimately involved 
in the work of our lives. And so Paul says, in the view of God's mercy, um, he continues on, and when, when we, as we consider some of this, Paul in the previous chapters has really been talking about the sovereignty of God. Because God has created all things, God can do anything with it He desires. God, and in the, in the chapter just before this, God can um, gr graft in any branch He wants. God can break off or cut away any branch that He sees fit. It is up to Him to choose. But the good news is that if you are sitting here today, at some point God tapped you on the shoulder. God drawed you to, drew you to Him. God whispered in your ear. And his spirit spoke within your heart and reminded you that you have a God who not only created you, but also loves you and is with you today. And you've been seeking him as he draw, drew you to him. So in, verse, in, in view of God's mercies, then Paul says now, present yourself back to God as a living sacrifice. Because of his mercies and his love, because what he has done for you and what he has given to you, now sacrifice yourself back to him. That is, that is a picture he wants us to paint. And so then in chapter 12, um, and, then, and then what we'll read in 13, Paul looks at some of the parts of our lives and describes how we can sacrifice ourselves back to him. What it looks like when we sacrifice ourselves to the Lord. And he gives us some examples. He writes about uh, the renewing of our minds. We want to put off the thinking of this world and instead fill our minds with the will of God. He writes about how we should use our gifts as they function within the church. That God has given each person uh, uh, spiritual gifts, ministry gifts, motivational gifts that can be used for the glory of building his kingdom. And that those gifts don't belong to you. They were a gift from God to be used within the church and be used for ministry and to be used in the world around you for his glory and his kingdom. Not to build your own kingdom, that's how we typically use our gifts. That's where we like to use our gifts. That's where we want to put our efforts. But our gifts don't belong to us. They're given to us for the glory of God in His kingdom. And so he says, present ourselves as a living sacrifice. And that's one of the ways. Then he talks about love. And that love is a kind of love that looks around the world. And when we see something that is wrong, we should actually hate it. And in a sense, we hate it so much that we're willing to get up off the couch and do something about it. It doesn't do any good to sit there hating it from afar, shaking your finger and wagging your tongue. Love needs to get into, in the game. Love needs to be in action and be put into a place where we begin to make a difference in the world. <clears throat> chapter 12 is an outstanding chapter. Uh, and and we, it began, we, we began last week, Grayson told the story that just in a chance statement, I mentioned somebody that had read the chapter every day for a year and uh, how it changed his life and this idea of saturation with the scripture. And if your chair time is a little stale, if you need, a, you want to try something different, maybe this is something for you. Read chapter 12, Romans 12, every day. Uh, for a time, whatever that might look like. And it's just an idea. It's not a prescription by any means, but it's a way to saturate our mind so that we can have the thoughts of God. Okay, let's go on then. Chapter 13 as we continue this idea. And I gave Grayson the easy one and I'm taking back the hard one. This one, ah, pray, pray that it goes well. Okay. Romans 13 verse 1. Talks about submission to authorities. Number one, verse one, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. 
Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. And honor to whom honor is owed. So let's take a break. We see a few principles here about government. We're going to break this down. I'm going to leave the hardest one for the last. Number one, government is established by God. It's clear that he is laying it out that is God's plan, it is God's purpose, it is God's design that government would have authority over our lives. Paul begins by saying, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. I think it's the NIV that says, let every soul. And I, I don't know, that word has been popping out to me lately. Because we're reminded, we're not just people. We're souls. We're God's souls. It were souls that matter and are important and have an eternal destiny. And he starts out by saying, let every person be subject to governing authority. See, the Bible teaches us that Christians should not live in civil disobedience. The principle of governance is instituted by God. You should pay your taxes. You should drive the speed limit. You need to be to work on time. You cannot steal from the store. You must be responsible with the property that you have. You need to be grateful. You need to gratefully fulfill the jobs and the tasks that are given to you by your managers, and so on and so forth. Any area of life where there is authority and governance, it is your responsibility to be obedient to that government. We, but the, because the problem is, we don't. We often do not like being governed. That's why Paul says that we need to be obedient to government because within our flesh, we don't always like it. We don't like to be told what to do. We don't like to be told that you have to do this or you cannot do that. But Paul continued that God has all authority and in his great wisdom knows that we must be governed. It is his design to set overseers uh, in our lives because that is what creates organization, that is what creates society. How many of you have watched bad governments destroy society and people? Good government help it to flourish and, 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 and come alive. Whether it's a national level or a state level or a business level or within your home, it's about leadership. And so whether it's leadership in any of those areas, we need good government to guide us. We are in a voting cycle, folks. We need to be thinking about our vote. And it is our opportunity to Speak our mind on the things that are important to us and share our voice to the collective that helps to bring that government into power. We need to be praying for our leaders. We need to accept that government is God's design and plan. Why? Because we are selfish and prideful people. And left to our own devices and our own will, we are only going to do and only going to care about what we care about and what we want. We're only going to look to the things that, that, that take care of us. That's what we are so naturally good at. And without government, we have chaos. And we have anarchy. And we have people doing whatever they want. And we all get incensed and, and, and go out of our minds when that crazy person goes flying down the street way too fast. But we need to understand that all of us as people are 
prone to or could succumb to the same kind of activity or, uh, or chaos without government. I mean, how many of us have found out, you know, saw that the, the needle on the dial of the speedometer was a little bit higher than it ought to have been? And the, and the thought in your mind is, oh, I better slow down because there might be a cop around. <laughs> and so we, we, obey the, we, obey, we obey the rules because we're afraid of getting in trouble. And that's, that's the most natural, that's probably the most common. I mean, that's where it, it, it kind of comes back to our selfishness. And so what we understand is that authority is good for us because it's good for our society. And so we must pray for wise leaders. We hope for good leaders. And whatever we get, we will let them govern and continue to pray and hope. John Maxwell said this, everything rises and falls on leadership. Societies need good government and God has set the model for us. And he says this modern this model of governance governance is what builds societies. So, government is established by God. Second of all, government is for our good. Government is for the good of all people, but it, it we need to recognize that we benefit as individuals as well. Sometimes we see governance and authority as something that takes away from us or hinders us or costs us. But the reality is without it, we be in chaos. I met with... Um, I met, was meeting with Michael. He's back from Kenya. And Michael Bushebi is in town again. And he's uh, back to ministering and, and uh, traveling and all kinds of things. In his parents' church in Bongoma, their normal uh, electric bill is about $160 a month. Then, uh, I, I think he said it was last month, they suddenly got a bill for $6,000. How would you like that to show up on your doorstep? And so, obviously, they went, there must be some mistake. And uh, they are convinced it is the kind of normal government corruption that they deal with on a daily basis. I, I just can't even tell you all the stories. It's a normal thing to them. And they went down and they, they disputed the charges and said, well, we need to discuss this. Why is it like this? And they said, we'll pay your bill and then we'll discuss it with you. Do you know how lucky we are to live in a country that is governed properly? We may not always like it or agree with it. It may not always go our way. But actually, government is for our good. Verse 3 says, If you do what is good, you'll receive approval. And if you do what is wrong, you should be afraid because you face the sort of judgment. A few years back, we had uh, some work being done in the neighborhood. And they came and wanted to change out our gas meter. And so they shut off our gas, they changed out the meter, and they came and they knocked on the door and said, well, we'll relight any of your appliances that need to be relit. And so they came in and they checked out our furnace and they said, we can't relight your furnace, it's too old. And they red tagged our meter and left us off. And so suddenly now we're looking at, we have to replace uh, a furnace, a gas furnace, and, and I, I don't know, I'll say it was around $3,000. Money that, uh, this is the parsonage, so the church, you know, I'm talking with the board, and what are we going to do? And, they, and we talked about the reasons, and we were trying to figure out some workarounds and so on. And, and uh, they said that the, the biggest issue was that there was some work that had been done over the years that had been done wrong, and they couldn't turn it back on because of airflow and all this kind of thing. And I was getting frustrated and how are we going to pay for $3,000 and what are we going to do and so on. And the guy was, he was very patient with me. I was not very patient with him. <laughs> and I was so upset and I was so frustrated and what are we going to do and how are we going to pay for this and I got to go and, and you know and then it's wrestling with the board to get the money and all this kinds of business. And then we got the furnace uh, changed out and I was talking with the man that changed the furnace. And the furnace was over 40 years old. That's definitely old. Some are out there that are older. 
bunny the i think it's called the heat exchanger inside and that's where the fire burns he said it's so old and so rusted out it was just waiting to go and at any moment it could have started spewing you know the toxic gases into our air supply while while we were unaware or maybe while we're asleep and he said and he said it's so good that you are changing this out and here i was really frustrated with code enforcement with rules, with costing me money. But the reality is it probably saved our lives. That's the point. We have police departments and fire departments that helped us with safety. We have, we have infrastructure set, uh, uh, development. We have all these things. Government is actually for our good. And it blesses us. Okay, number three. And this is the hard one to figure out. Government is still under God's authority. Now, we probably understand that statement. We recognize that all government is still under God's authority. Here's the part that's hard to reconcile. Paul said in verse 1 that the authorities that exist have been instituted by God. It seems to me, then, it's a fair question to ask, does God handpick every government and every leader that comes along? That's kind of what it says what it seems to say. It made me ask the question, so what about Joseph Stalin who tortured and executed 20 million people? What about Mao Tse Sung who is believed to have taken between 300 and 100 million souls? What about Adolf Hitler? What about the bloody, the bloody circuses of the Emperor Nero that uh, killed so many Christians at the beginning of the church? What about this guy Vlad the Impaler Dracula we, we think of him as a fictional character uh, of, of, of stories and things. It's actually a, a real person. He was a Romanian monarch who killed in, innocent people and drank their blood just because it was fun. The stories of what he did are just unbelievable. The torture and, and uh, treatment of, of innocent lives. And there's countless others in varying degrees of what we would think is wrongdoing. Does God put each and every one of those in place? Are these appointments from God? And what should we do if we should find ourselves under government that we disagree with? What if we find ourselves under a government that, did, that is doing evil? When do we resist an evil government? And when... And when we do that, are we going against God's authority? Uh, it's another place I want to admit to you that I don't have real clear answers on, um, but I'll give you my opinion on it. And uh, what I, this was again, one I just had to read over and over and over and try to understand what is being taught here or what we are said. And let me give you three more guiding principles then. Number one, Every government is always under the authority of God. No matter what they are, no matter what they're doing, no matter uh, I, I, who they think they are, whatever's going on, they are still under the authority of God. There's a story in the Old Testament about ne uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. And he challenged that truth and said that he was higher than God and more powerful God. And this kingdom belonged to him. But he lost his kingdom. There were pharaohs and emperors who claimed to be God. And yet the one true God used them as pawns of his own design in, in, in many ways. We think of, I was thinking of Nero that did the, uh, the circuses at the Colosseum that killed so many Christians and the lions. And what happened was that during that time, because of fear, Christians started scattering and leaving the area. And moving outward. And what happened was, because they were leaving and running for their lives, really, the church began to spread all over the world. And so what one man was using for evil, God still used for good. And God was able to overcome that situation. And so even when it's bleak and even when it's awful, we need to just trust our God. And we need to see that he is still in control and he is still in authority and he can use whatever he needs to for his will. And it's about us trusting him. Second of all, I believe that Paul here is talking about the principle of government and not 
always specific rulers. This is where I'm going to give you my opinion on this verse. Part of the reason I say that is actually verse 3. It says, rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but bad. That made me think, is that true? Is that what I see happening? Because I've seen a lot of people that did nothing wrong who got in a lot of trouble for it. Because of bad leadership, because of bad government. Uh, right here in our own country, we have seen far too many African Americans be terrorized for no offense at all other than the color of their skin. When you look back into our history, but even up to this day, evil people just do evil things. And some will call themselves even the hand of God while they're doing evil things. And, the, and so there's a principle here that says that if you do what's good and you do what's right, generally speaking, you can believe and trust that you will be treated fairly under a good system. But not everything operates under a good system. And so it's a, it's a principle that says you don't have to worry about the policeman if you're not doing anything wrong. And I find that the people that complain about the policeman typically are the ones that did do something wrong. They got caught and now they have to pay for it. And so um, there, it seems that there are, it's speaking of a principle of government that says we want good government and we respect that government. And there's some occasion where uh, we also need to respect that the authority of God is higher than the authority of man. In Acts chapter 4, uh, they were, um, the apostles were thrown in jail and accused of doing something against the government. And they said, well, should we follow the laws of man or should we follow the laws of God? You choose. I was thinking back to the, um, the Underground Railroad during the time when, when slaves, poorly mistreated, were trying to escape to freedom. And so many people were defying government, deceiving, lying, hiding, because the sanctity of life was more important than the law of the land in their, at that time. And others have done similar things where they sought out the will of God over the government that was above them. And so I believe that what he's talking about here is that he's saying that this is a principle, that government is established by God. But there are cases, uh, although we have many examples, I think typically rare for us, where we need to um, go beyond the government's control. And generally speaking, for us in our lives, the principle is pay your taxes to who you owe taxes. Pay revenue to who you owe revenue. Respect those who deserve respect and honor those who deserve to be honored. And then the third one is showing respect to those in authority can demonstrate our witness for Jesus Christ. How we treat those in authority shows a measure of our Christian maturity. It shows a measure of how Christ is living within us. Especially when we're able to treat others well when they do not treat us well. If you love those who love you, the Bible says, well, what benefit do you have? Jesus said to love even your enemy. And pray for those who persecute you. You see, when Paul wrote these words, uh, he wrote them under Roman government control. His Savior just killed, executed by Pontius Pilate, who was probably one of the worst governors that had ever lived. Under the control of Emperor Nero, some would say one of the worst emperors that ever lived. And it is within that climate and that context, he's talking to various zealot Jews who believed and actively taught that you have no authority above you except God. And Paul says, no, that's not what God's design. In fact, you need to show that you belong to Christ by how you submit even to authority. It's a way that we crawl up onto that altar of sacrifice and lay down our lives. Okay, let's look at the next section briefly. Um, we'll move through it much quicker. 
as it lays out, it, I think it kind of extends some of this, especially this idea of being a, of our witness. We go into verse eight and, it, and we ask this question, how can we be a witness for Jesus? Number eight, owe no one anything except to love each other for the one who loves another has fulfilled the, the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, or any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, and therefore love is the fulfilling of the law.